You're listening to a podcast from thespoilist.com. Welcome to First Contact, a podcast exploring every episode of Star Trek The Next Generation very slowly. I'm Andrew. I'm James. And I'm Alex. This week we were watching Tin Man. It was written by Dennis Putnam Bailey and David Bischoff, directed by Robert Shearer, and it first aired the week of April 23rd, 1990. James, what happens in this one? The Enterprise is busy pottering along when it's diverted on a new mission following an awkwardly chummy encounter with the captain of the HUD. Tam Elbrun, a mission specialist in first contact situations, comes on board with an abrupt manner and a dark past with both Troy and Riker. The Enterprise's new orders are to make contact with an ancient living spaceship known as Tin Man, which is orbiting a star about to go supernova. Turns out Tam has a weird, psychic connection to the ship, but can he make it on board before the star explodes? Or before the Romulans destroy it? Oh yeah, the Romulans turn up too for some reason. Well, it's an episode based around a guest performance, and those can go either way. You've never seen it before. What did you think of it, Alex? I started watching it and I thought, ah, I can see how this is going to end. And it did. (laughs) And I, I spent the next hour waiting for it to reach that crescendo. Really? Did you think, you know, a a symbiotic relationship between a psychic and a living ship was an obvious way to go? Yes. I I, I was trying to think of something funny, but, uh, like, this... uh, The episode has sort of drained all enthusiasm or creativity from my mind. (laughs) In, in, In stark contrast... The voices very much are not speaking to me right now. Well, let's go through the episode in an extremely tedious way then. So, uh, it starts off, they're uh, surveying systems for Federation colonisation, because they don't have enough planets right now, quite frankly. You know, they've got a little Irish farming planet with 60 people on it, they've got the planet of geniuses, they've got the planet where they're making clever genetically modified children but they need more planets anyway hang on hang on hang on who are these people who keep agreeing to this colonization who knows because every time it's it's like some remote group of people they're just throwing down on these planets and we've seen episodes before where they go to visit them and it's sort of one mad doctor and his assistant where do they keep finding these weirdos <laughs> are, are they are they all getting destroyed and eaten by the crystalline entity and the children are drawing disturbing pictures i guess there's some video somewhere in the federation where they go colonize a new planet it's a great experience this could be you you yes you fellow do you hate people often have the most fun when everyone else has left the room well why not spend an eternity alone? Take your close companion with their young daughter and then fall in love with them as they reach womanhood. After all, remember, in space, it's not illegal. Not everybody finds it so exciting because, and it's a great way to start the episode, Picard describes their mission as tedious. <laughs> we open the episode with the main character describing... What is about to happen as tedious? I'm sorry, everyone. It's a bit shit this week. (laughs) But no. No. Then the hood is on an intercept course, and it's exciting. From Thunderbirds? (laughs) No. (laughs) Although that would be excellent. I'd watch that. Yeah. Ben Kingsley um, comes to play against Patrick Stewart. Jonathan Frakes could direct. It it would all come together. (laughs) But... No, it's it's the hood with Captain DeSoto. Hey, everyone, it's Captain DeSoto. The audience whips and cheers as this guy comes on. Everyone banters in a slightly weird way. Hey, I was R- Riker's captain before he left for the Enterprise. 
Riker doesn't exchange a single word, but Captain Picard's happy to see this guy. And I thought, oh man, they're building up. Everyone loves this guy. This is great. He's going to die in a minute, isn't he? No, he's just going to wander into obscurity. What, what was that all about? Was it just, well, we're going to have to create some personality for this sequence. Uh, we don't want it just to be a, another ship dropping a man off. Um, so let's let's make everyone love Captain DeSoto, despite him having nothing to do and basically no dialogue other than there's there's a guy coming on board your ship. You remember him, don't you, Riker? Yeah? Everybody loves Captain DeSoto. Everyone does love Captain DeSoto. I mean, who will never appear again. <laughs> its whole function is there to generate a bit of mystery. Uh, it's sort of, oh, oh, what's going to play out? You might find him a bit unusual. Well, what's going to happen? And then uh, that whole question is answered in about 30 seconds. Oh, he, he can read everyone's minds and he's constantly answering for people. Oh, I'm, that 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 is it. Well, there are multiple threads to try and make him seem mysterious. You have that with Captain DeSoto, sort of knowingly going, "Huh, this guy," and then you have Riker going, "The guy from that incident." Oh my God! And then you have um, Troy going, "He was my patient." Fine. So we're all working to build a mystery or an intrigue around this character, and. Then you get to the character, the reveal, and, you know, he's just not a very nice person. And he's kind of abrupt with everyone. He knows what everyone's going to say because he's psychic. But I think it all comes down to this performance. You don't have to be likeable to be an interesting character. And I really like Harry Greener as an actor. He's brilliant in Buffy the Vampire Slayer much later on. But... In this episode, uh, like he's just not very sympathetic, not very likable, not much fun to be around. Doesn't show us anything about the rest of the crew either. So, building an episode around this character, it's kind of difficult to invest in it. I thought the tone was a bit all over the place at that point as well. It it seemed that they couldn't decide at, at the very start whether they are going for the mystery or the comedy because they, they try to play up that comedy element a bit with him interrupting everyone. Uh, like some, you know, and telling everyone what this, the voice he's hearing like some shit Derek Acora or as he's <laughs> otherwise known, Derek Acora. Um, but... Yeah, it just it it stumbles there, and and in some respects, I wonder if if they played that up more, whether it would have worked for me more. That that idea that he's really obnoxious, but in a sort of smarmy way from knowing what everyone's going to say, not just in a yeah no shut up I already know you're, you're wasting time, because that was just a bit t- tedious to watch. Um, and if he'd been more smarmy with it, maybe I'd I'd have gone with it more. I think we already have enough comedy episodes with mind readers. That I, I'm glad we didn't go that direction here. But it's interesting that you say that, though, because it is the same technique that they're trying to deploy here, which is the abrasive character trying to kind of rough up these very dull leads that we have. You know, just someone to come in and shake it up a bit. But I just... I don't think it particularly works here. You you have this very troubled individual as well, and it's just it's not particularly fun to watch. Your your sympathy should lie with him, but if he just makes it so difficult. Also, I I I have a slight issue. How does an empath going to an empath counselor work? I I I'm feeling a lot of anxiety. I can feel your anxiety. I know you can feel my anxiety, but don't think I'm a prick. I didn't think you're a prick. I can th- see that you think that I'm a prick. I just... Uh, how is that... I mean, it makes the conversation shorter. I mean, maybe they just <laughs> sit in a room silently together. I guess there's just not enough... depth to... The, the things that are supposed to be troubling him. So he's hearing all these voices. That's that's quite an interesting 
concept to play with that he knows what everyone's thinking all the time he can never be in a social situation that that's something again i'm going to mention buffy the vampire Slayer <laughs> again um they did an episode called earshot where buffy gets these psychic abilities and can't shut them down and that's brilliant but i don't think we explore that enough and i also think this this incident where this first contact gone wrong which sounds hilarious incidentally well every first contact goes wrong um and three series of this show have proved that. But I'm not invested in that. I think it feels so tacked on. This, oh, Riker knows about this and he's got a grudge. It, it feels like it's written to give a character something to do rather than organically arising from the plot, I think. It, it just... It, it doesn't really feel like it needed to be there even. You could just have him having a sort of slightly dark reputation and i don't think it actually adds or takes anything away it's a kind of cheap way to say he's troubled without actually it's telling not showing it's it's that classic problem i've got a problem i'm usually a reasonable man this guy must be bad no i i would agree and the problem that i have is that it just seems you're right it seems to be tacked on it seems to be very loose connections being made so with that example of how does the counselor work it just seems that oh he's uh, he's hearing voices oh well then he'd see a counselor troy's a counselor great he's an ex patient no one seems to stop and think well that doesn't make any sense why why would you do that it doesn't matter we've written five pages already it's it's remarkable how much time passes with so little happening i guess the most interesting relationship is the the psychic with data uh, he cannot read the mm. mind of the android. That that's the most intriguing part of it, and the most interesting part. And it's, and and data, thinks, oh, am I just nothing? Am I not really a, a soul? But he's just like, no, you're different. And actually, I like spending time with you because I don't know anything about you. I, I can get to know you normally. And that that plays out quite nicely. I think that's you know an exploration of of what the android is uh, and also how they interact with a different kind of character that we don't normally see. Although, to be honest, Troy can sense people like on planets and on other starships and stuff, can't she? So surely if he's just in a room with one person when there's a whole ship around, that shouldn't really make any difference. It's a magic room. It is a magic room. Um, Does it feel just cliched at this point? The, the idea of an outsider coming onto the ship and being interested in data. It just seems like every other week they're now doing a storyline where that's at the core. It is. It is what it is. It's a, very much a Star Trek The Next Generation. And and I guess you, you always get that. And you get it in at least one movie as well. You know, data befriending a child because they have that outlook and they've done it in this show as well. Yeah, it is a cliche, but it's it's certainly a more natural thing to do if you're bringing this character on board than than the weird stuff with Riker. I I'd agree. I I actually think it's it's a bit of a shame, really, that it only sort of picks up on oh oh that's the interesting part of the plot right at the end when Data starts to ruminate on what what constitutes existence, what what is. The difference between a, a normal mind and just a sentient android, um, and and we've had it before, but there's a reason for that. It's you know the 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 philosophical aspect of that is kind of interesting to explore, um, and it is the only interesting thing, really, without without developing something else that's in the episode to a much greater degree than there is actually presented in the show here um you could have perhaps done a lot more with with tim man um but they don't really do that much with tim man they're much more focused on this person coming onto the ship i would say thematically that ties in with the tin man stuff not explicitly not as much as it should do the parallels are not really drawn or written as much as they should be that what makes a life form, what makes something alive, 
and you have this living ship, which they never really get across properly. And and it's it, it's again you've got this character on board who is the psychic who then tells you all the stuff about the ship. We never find anything about the ship directly. We have no other verification for this. So it's essentially someone narrating saying this is what this ship does. This is what this ship is. It's called Gomp2. It's called Gomp2? Yes, it's called Gomp2. That sounds like a rather silly <laughs> science fiction name, doesn't it? Well, yes. But I'm telling you this ship and it's living. Oh, the things it's seen, the places it's been. But we're not going to try and portray this visually in any way. What we're going to do is have me standing here talking about it. Then we're going to go on board the ship and I'm going to do some drama school acting, and it's going to look a little bit fleshy, but not anything as good as what you'd see in Farscape or something, which actually portrays a living ship rather well. This is just, you know, a way of telling a short story without really telling it, because the Tin Man stuff is so underdone and underdeveloped, and it's like, we've got this story here about the ship that lives, um, but we've got to tell it in a star trek the next generation way so we're going to bring in romulans and we're going to have lots of talking on the ship and the actual story the actual interesting bit that we want to tell about a ship committing suicide in a supernova we are just kind of going to have on the periphery the the living ship is is such a wasted opportunity because uh, you're right it's not the most visually stunning but there's a nice sort of cronenberg type of vibe to it when the chair raises out of the floor my mind instantly just starts thinking, long live the new flesh! And, and well, partly that, and then I partly also think about, is all furniture made of flesh on, on this ship? <laughs> what, what happens when you need the toilet? Uncomfortable. <sighs> but that, that would feel like a fresh idea. Except it was, it was done in Encounter at Farpoint. <laughs> Well, to an extent, but actually being in the belly of the beast, quite literally, in in Encounter at Farpoint, it was more of a sort of plot twist, oh, we're doing this, whereas that, that symbi- symbiotic nature, there's there's something interesting to be explored there, but it's really just a, a side note. To the, the story, um, a, a reason to link the two plot strands together. Well, the the problem is the major problem is that it's not about encountering the ship. It's not actually about making that first contact because that ultimately ends up as one scene, which is very rushed in the end. It's all about obstacles. It's about not getting to the ship. It's about not communicating with this ship and the reasons you can't. So you have. We don't trust this guy, so we're not going to trust him to, to actually go and make the first contact. We've got the Romulans chasing us, and our, our ship is now broken, and we, we can't get to it because of the stuff. So it's all about delaying this, actually not getting there, not telling the story, not actually understanding about symbiosis, not seeing what that means, exploring what that means in any way. Because we don't, it's basically like, oh, he's gone. Oh, they, they did a thing. Bye. We're not going to see that. You're going to get thrown away in that special effect that we've used a few times now to show the Enterprise travelling really fast. It's amazing the number of things that can throw a starship to warp, aren't there? That, that's the problem. The story is very different from the plot here. And I think mm-hmm. that's frustrating in, in so many ways because all the interesting bits are... Not in the episode, essentially. It's character stuff, when actually they should be doing science fiction stuff. I think the episode is perfectly summed up by the name of Tim Man. This episode is complete gone to. It it is just a generic sci-fi name which they've not had a second draft of. And just went back to it and said, "Could, could we think of something better than gone to? No, so it'll do. And there's, there's just so much of this episode which feels tacked on and, and poorly thought through. You know, I, I'm surprised it wasn't just the Romulans. I'm surprised they didn't also have a group of Ferengi who were trying to make contact so that they could sell Tin Man. And they didn't have Picard just decide to go to the holodeck to play a Dixon Hill novel as well. 
Oh, I went and and Wesley should have done like some sort of science project as well, which for some reason tied into the ending. That would that would have been everything they they needed in this episode of just lazy tagged on generic stories. Even if he'd been doing a science project about, you know, symbiotic relationships or parasites or something like that, which could have been really cheap metaphors going, look, this is what the episode's about. And Star Trek should not shy away from those. If Discovery doesn't do that sort of thing, I'm going to be very upset. I I like it when Star Trek embraces its artifice and points out the parallels in its stories and you know, becomes a play, becomes about something. And I think that's another problem. What What is this about, really? All the elements that they throw at the wall, ultimately, what, what, what would you say the theme is? It's that troubled souls can come together for a greater good? Sometimes, yeah. A, a lonely soul will find another lonely soul and find a purpose. It, it's 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 very Mills and Boone in that sense, isn't it? <laughs> they had been waiting for each other all of their lives, and only then would they become complete. If this is them trying to tell a, a thematic storyline which has parallels to modern day, I I just I don't I don't want episodes like this at all. I just I you know I. I, I want episodes where the robot does stand-up comedy. That's that's what I want over this. You know where I think the problem might be? It's it's the fact that the episode is adapted from a novel. Well, a short story before a novel. This plot has already gone through two previous versions. Mm. And then they've sold it to TNG. And they're not really... Trying? Oh, I get the sense that they're <laughs> they're not they're not making a show for Star Trek. They are taking their plot and just working Star Trek around it, which isn't necessarily disastrous, but it, it just means that things just don't seem to fit naturally, and it it just doesn't work. No, they've not they've not done it properly. They've not told the story in a Star Trek way. They've got a story going on in the background and the Enterprise just happens to be around it. It it just it doesn't hang together. I'm very sorry. I'm sure they'll be very upset about the story that they already saw three times doesn't quite work. <laughs> there have been some good Star Trek episodes based on short stories. I think the Voyager episode Blink of an Eye was based on a short story, wasn't it? That's that's brilliant. I mean, that is one of the all-time greatest episodes of Star Trek, as far as I'm concerned. It's a perfectly reasonable thing to do, take a science fiction story and tell it on essentially the greatest television sci-fi stage. There is nothing wrong with that. Star Trek can embrace virtually any idea that you can think of and, and anything that you can do in space. I think it's because the the writing room isn't really at this time, in a position to fix things. They're they're struggling to put out their own fires rather than other people's. So having to, you know, fix a short story into a full episode, it's not within the ability of this writing room. In a year or two's time, they could do it. But season three, they're, they're still in panic mode. Would you say this is, uh, uh, you know, I I have absolutely no idea, but is this generally regarded as a good episode or or not? I'm I'm just intrigued. It's as forgetful as you can get. Nobody would ever really talk about it. Good. <laughs> is it bad though? Like I don't think it's bad. It's just really not good. I would rather have some of the episodes which had bits of offensiveness in them because at least they were trying to do something a bit more interesting this doesn't really even seem seem to have tried it just kind of potted along with generic sci-fi ideas that next generation has already done i mean i don't think tng up to this point has very often done the big guest star episode which i think this is sort of a version of that you know you've got something like the outrageous arcana 
I was which, thinking of that episode as well. Which is, you know, a guy comes on board, he is charming and wonderful, and it's kind of interesting. You've basically got Han Solo on on the Enterprise. And this, like, I think I would have rather had Captain DeSoto come on board, because at least he would have been charismatic and interesting and played off the crew. Here you've just got a guy who... It doesn't work. It doesn't work the character, essentially. It, you, you've kind of tried for a, a science fiction character. And, uh, let's oh, imagine if Troy was amplified by 10. That sounds wonderful. Let's put that in an episode. No. It's just her walking around with a megaphone. Other than all the plot stuff, I think that central performance, or that central the writing of that central performance is not good enough in any way and not interesting enough and i just i just don't want my characters to be sort of poor me sort of self-involved and you know not not without reason but I need I need some way into the character, and I don't think they give us that here. They try to make him sympathetic with the counselling sessions and the con- conversations with Data, but I just don't think they ever get there. I mean, if it makes you feel any better, I can pitch you a worse version of the episode, which is the same, but the powers are imbued to Riker, and then we get pretty much a shot-for-shot remake of what women want. But would he learn more about himself and learn to love... Well, he might go on a racist tirade in a cafe. Let's talk. Let's talk a little bit about the ending. Data and Tam go onto the ship after a, a, having to convince Captain Picard that it'll be fine, it'll be good, and it's, this is the right thing to do. So finally, we can actually get to the point of the episode, and they go on to the ship, and then, oh, this is my home. I'm part of the ship now. Bye. And then suddenly it cuts away and the Enterprise gets thrown out of the exploding star and Data's back on the ship. And then he cuddles Counselor Troy and says, he found peace. Data, you did learn. (laughs) Yeah, essentially. And we've all learned something today about lost souls. Throw them into supernovas. He wanted to tell the crew, you know, so they'd understand. And it's like, well, the crew didn't care. Nobody cared. No one was interested, really. They're just glad they didn't get blown up by the ticking clock of the supernova that wasn't really causing any peril or threat anyway. So, what essentially you're saying, the message that you should take from Captain Picard of this episode is, he's waiting there because he's going to top himself. Well, let him. I think I should go and save him. Well, that's your lookout. It ends kind of abruptly. So let's go to Quickfire. Quickfire. Ten minutes later. This is great. I Finally, I'm not hearing all the voices. I'm just hearing the one voice. And, and now we can go out and explore space together in this sentient ship. I'm quite hungry. Bollocks. There's no food. There's no water. I do not live an infinite life. What a terrible decision I have made with my time. No wonder all the crew died out. Maybe the ship eats people. Maybe people eat the ship? Well, presumably, if it's a living ship, it needs to eat something. So, you know, maybe it eats something and then he eats the ship's excrement. It eats happiness. I mean, we don't know what happens in that chair. I dread to think what happens in that chair. Well, that's the thing. If you're taking the symbiosis to the next level, in Farscape, like, you know, the the pilot is, you know, tied into the ship. So maybe the ship just inserts tendrils into parts of his body and they become one. Are Are you suggesting that the ship is getting some sexual kick out of this for having him inside it? No, you you always come back to some kind of sexual kick, don't you? I'm just saying that maybe they would become more entwined. They would become physically entwined as well as mentally. And and that's fine. That's lovely. We respect everyone's right to choose how they live their lives. 
So the the attack special effect that Gomzu does is a, a reuse of the evolution sequence of V'ger um, from the end of Star Trek The Motion Picture. According to the writer Dennis Bailey, they were inspired to write a script for the series after watching Samaritan Snare, which he considered, in quotes, the most abysmal piece of Star Trek ever filmed. Has he not seen Shades of Grey then? <laughs> Hand, hands up who remembers Samaritan Snare. Yeah, yeah, it's the episode where um, they want Geordi to make the ship go. The ambient sounds that Gomtu made were derived from sounds recorded from sound effects editor Jim Wolverton's stomach through a stethoscope while he was eating a pizza. Now, you see, I would have actually liked more 40 minutes of just the sound effects editor Jim Wolverton eating a pizza. That that would have been much more preferable to this episode. He's just sitting there naked eating a pizza <laughs> with a stethoscope. <laughs> who would not want that (laughs) I knew I had some sound effects to record so I made sure that I ordered extra cheese (laughs) did they have to pay for the pizza because it was used for the the sound on the show did that that count as an expense Um, hey Jim we've been looking at your expenses and there's a lot of Bills from Domino's? It's essential research. Four extra large, extra meaty? I had a lot of sound effects that night. (laughs) Do you want it to sound like a ship in space, or do you want it to sound like toot? You won't believe what I've just read on Memory Alpha. What have you read, James? The growing chair. You know, the, the chair that grows... From gum to? Hmm? Well, it's, it doesn't actually grow. It's a wax chair. And it's melting. It, it, it's, it's melting. It's not growing. It's melting. Did, but did, how, how can that be? Because it seems to grow. It's, it's like they, they've got this weird kind of video editing technique where it, they reverse it somehow. Oh, we're living in the future. And I've got to say... Ha, ha, Building a chair, a giant chair candle, and then melting it for that <laughs> two second shot was really not worth it. Could have just had it off screen and just had someone raising it up a little bit. <laughs> Thanks once again for joining us. You all told us it was going to get good. We'll be back again next week when we'll be talking about Hollow Pursuits. Until then, goodbye. 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 Imagine if it was just an actual chair candle and they just had to light it in the middle and it took like three days for this to melt. Someone bought his wife the most extravagant of anniversary gifts, the candle chair, and came back on set two days later. Just the spark. (laughs) Well, I'm looking forward to giving the wife my candle chair. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. I'm sorry, Steve, we thought it was a prop. You mean you burnt my candle chair? <laughs> you know, it, well, you can still take your... It's all over the floor! It's in a puddle! It's a little known fact that every chair on Star Trek is a candle chair. They just only light that one. <laughs> it's a little known fact, but uh, partway through Series 2, they actually just replaced Patrick Stewart with the waxwork. But under heavy studio lighting, his face did tend to melt. Mm.